little more than a dozen years ago when my grandson Hudson was about two years old, I took him over to Forest Lawn, Glendale. Taking him by the hand, we entered into the court of honor where the uh, Last Supper is displayed in stained glass windows. I know that many of you have been there. The tour guide was giving us a lecture in the entryway as we looked up at the mighty uh, statue of Moses uh, carved by Michelangelo. Hudson, Hudson listened with wide-eyed silence. He seemed to be taken by the grandeur and the awe of the setting. When we entered the hall where Leonardo da Vinci's Last Supper with the state stained glass window was portrayed, he, I sat him on my lap and he put his head on my shoulder. I whispered in his ear the story about Jesus and the Last Supper. After the presentation was over, we viewed the statuary around the room. We stood just a few feet away from the Pieta, Michelangelo's work of Mary holding the crucified Jesus on her lap. I showed him the nail print so purely carved in the statue's marble hand. He pointed and said, the mommy and her dead boy. I said, yes, but Jesus was a man when he died. Later, we left the grounds, and as we drove away, I said to Hudson, Hudson, tell me what you saw today. And with deep feeling and sadness in his little voice, he said, I saw the mommy and her dead little boy man. I had a great lump in my throat. As I was moved, as I realized that even the heart of this little two-year-old had realized there was an inexpressible attraction to the crucified Jesus. I thought of the words of Jesus. If I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. Yes, it's even true for a little two-year-old. Today, in our mind's eye, we're going back again to that Last Supper table and we will celebrate salvation. The communion, using the elements of the bread and wine as a memorial of Jesus' death on the cross and of the sinless life that he lived. When we ingest the bread and the wine, we remind ourselves that Jesus died to redeem us from the penalty of death but he also offered us his transforming life to change us into his image as we walk with him daily. Communion reminds us of our need of forgiveness and Christ's offer of everlasting life. See, we, we need to be reminded from time to time because as humans we tend to forget what God has done for us. In Jesus... If Jesus' disciples, who were first-hand witnesses, needed to observe the communion, then we also need to remind, have a reminder that Christ gave his life for us to redeem us from the consequences of sin. Nearly every time that the Bible mentions the Lord's Supper, the term covenant is used. Jesus stated, this cup is the new covenant of my blood. You see, a covenant is a pledge. It's a guaranteed agreement based on trust. Covenants were arranged by mutual consent between two, party, two parties. In some translations, they're referred to as testaments. The word covenant literally means to cover. It's in the sense of providing shelter, protection, or maybe even financial support. If I cover a bill, I compensate for it. Now in legal terms, a covenant is similar to a contract or a treaty or a compact, say like the Mayflower Compact. It commits each other, each other to a reality. To make a covenant, 
is to establish a binding agreement. When Jesus makes a covenant, it is 100% dependable. You see, in the Old Testament, God spoke, whenever God spoke of the, the term covenant, he used the words, my covenant. See, God took responsibility to keep the promise to us of our salvation. Whether it was his covenant with Abraham, excuse me, Adam, which was his, uh, the promise of enmity be between the evil one and mankind, or the covenant of protection made with Noah, or the Abrahamic covenant promising that he would become the father of a chosen people, or the Mosaic covenant where he chose to preserve a special people as a nation. In all these covenants, God initiated the covenant. But in the case of the Mosaic covenant, the people blurted out that they would be responsible to keep it. And all the others, God made the promise to covenant with his people. He gave Israel a chance to prove their promise, and they failed miserably. The same is true for us today. How many times have you, when you felt the need to reform, or you realize God, does, God has done something special, you blurt out, I'll never disobey you again. I will do whatever you ask. And before you know it, we failed again. You see, it reminds me of the statement in the books of, book Steps to Christ where it says our promises are like ropes of sand. When God covenanted with us, he wasn't demanding that we keep something on our own. He was giving us the life that we would be able, through his power and strength, to keep that relationship with him. You see, in terms of biblical covenants, they were confirmed with a sacrifice. Noah and Abraham didn't go out and hire a lawyer or draft a covenant or sign a document. The parties took a lamb, they killed it, they put it on an altar, they cut it in pieces, and the blood covenant, blood sacrifice, sealed the covenant. You see, it is through sacrifice that we are forgiven. God doesn't ignore or overlook sin. It must be atoned for. God's designed law is, will be satisfied. Sin extracts a price, a recompense, because the Bible says the wages of sin is death. In Romans 6.23, you see, before barcodes and electronic checkout devices, every item in the store had a price tag on it, so we knew what the cost would be. Sin in God's eyes carries a clear price tag, punishment. We can take the punishment, or we can accept the substitute that's provided for us. That's what the Lamb was all about. In the Old Testament, people would confess their sin over the head of the animal, and this animal would symbolically take their place. It was usually a lamb, sometimes other animals. But the one presenting the sacrifice offering was saying, in effect, what's about to happen to this animal is what deserves to happen to me. The place of sacrifice emphasized the truth that without the shedding of blood, there was no remission of sin. So the way of forgiveness through animal sacrifice anticipated and looked forward to the sacrifice of Christ upon the cross. Jeremiah made this prophetic de declaration. The time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judas, I will put my law into their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. I will forgive their wickedness. I will remember their sin no more. That promise is for us today. Jeremiah presented a covenant that had not yet been cut, 
Centuries later, Jesus realized and declared, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. It is a new covenant because God himself provided the sacrifice. Jesus ratified the terms with his own blood. See, the old covenant at Sinai had human promises that were faulty and impotent. It taught, taught a lesson. But the new covenant instituted by Jesus was far superior. Jesus gave each one of us the personal gift of his life, which he laid down. And then he gives us, now as we live on, the power to live through the life that he lived. And that gift came, comes to us through the Holy Spirit. He said, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is for your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. That Helper is the Holy Spirit. He brings Jesus' presence into each of our hearts as we invite him into our lives. In Romans 8, 8 and 9, it says, Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. If anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. So Jesus, the Holy Spirit, becomes the connection between us and God as he gives his, the very person and his very presence into our lives that his power might enable us to live the life of Christ. 1 John 3.24 says, And by this we know that he, Jesus, abides in us by the Spirit whom he has given us. And Galatians 3.14, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. So it is by trusting in the gift and receiving it that we are enabled to live a new life in Christ. Ephesians 3, 16, 17, and 19 says that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, that you may be full, filled with the fullness of God. So, by the person, the presence, and the power of the Holy Spirit, we have an indwelling of Jesus Christ that is giving us life to redeem us and to reform us. When Jesus said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood, he was giving us two illustrations about what blood would mean to us. You see, it is the shedding of blood that takes away life. And Jesus shed his blood that we might have eternal life. But the second thing that blood does is that it restores, it comes in, in the human body, it comes in and restores every single cell with life-giving energy, whether it's the water, the chemicals, or the, the, the food that is, comes to every cell, and then it takes away the waste. So Jesus is saying to us, his blood is cleansing for us. He changes us when we trust him to do the job. In the Bible, when two people sealed an agreement or a contract, they would sit down together and share a meal. There's something about eating together that binds people. So today, when we take this cup and this bread, we show that we accept the terms of the new covenant. We accept the very life and the end death of Jesus Christ. There are terms. We're sinners and we're guilty before God. We deserve the punishment, but Christ is our substitute, and he took on the punishment, and his blood was shed upon the cross. And if we accept this sacrifice, then his blood covers our sin. 
we've been forgiven on the basis of Christ's sacrifice. But then, God every day keeps writing his law of selfless love on our hearts and in our minds, enables us to live for him. So today, I invite you to partake of the table with these two wonderful remembrances that Jesus atoned, Jesus redeemed us, Jesus is also restoring us into his image. Make that a reality every day of your life. May God bless you as we partake in the ceremony. Let's sing hymn number 412, Covered with His Life, verses 1 and 4.